Good morning. Um, I'm so uh, excited that Moodle chose Minnesota for its first U.S. Moot. I'm uh, raised just about an hour north of here, and uh, the Surrey, uh, Surrey Brewery, the Saints game, I mean, you're hitting the best spots for sure, so this is wonderful. And it's also kind of special because how often does a hometown boy get asked to speak in their hometown? Like, never. Experts always come from the outside, don't they, right? Uh, here in Minnesota, like this is just Dave. He has another crazy idea, I don't listen to him. So anyway, you, you can be the judge of that but in the next 45 minutes, whether that is a crazy idea or not. So um, I, I have a question for you. Um, I, wanna, I wanna find out how many folks here, uh, I have a multiple choice question, so I, I need you to raise your hand. You can, you can vote as many times as you want. But what I wanna know is, um, why you came here, why you came to this meeting. And so here are the choices. You love course management systems. Okay, there's a few, there's a few, all right. Uh, because it's held in beautiful Minnesota. There we go, that's the right answer, right? And if we were to hold this in January, uh, keep those hands up. <laughs> Not quite as many, all right. Um, you like things that rhyme with poodle. One. Do we have security here? No, just kidding. Um, last choice. That we want to provide the best, this is obviously the right answer, right? We have, you want to provide the best educational learning experience for all your students, and you believe that open source software, open source course management systems are a good way to do that. There we go. All right. So, and that's pretty clear. I mean, just off the Moodle front page. It's about community. Um, read every sign that's in here. It's clear what this is about. And I'm going to talk about a very related theme here today. And it's, a, it's open education. And I think open is almost more of a philosophy than anything else. It's about this free exchange of ideas. And, and having no barriers between you, your students, and getting done what you want them to, to get done, which is learning, right? I want to start out by backing out a bit. I'm going to be talking about textbooks, which are kind of a boring, I mean, textbooks, really? But I, it's not really about textbooks. It's really about this. It's really about our belief, and I think I'm assuming that we're all in agreement here, that we believe that all students should have equal access to education to higher education. And when I first saw this, this is from the U.S. Declaration of, of uh, sorry, the, the, the U.N. Declaration of Human Rights. When I first saw it, read this years ago, my first reaction as, from a very U.S.-centric perspective here, right here, was, oh, those poor people in other countries that don't have that good access to higher education. But as I got involved more and more in certain projects, I realized that there is a gap here as well in the US and in any developed country, to be honest. Well, not all of them, but we won't go there. This is a study that studied like the first decade of this century, basically, of the 21st century, and they're basically saying that there were 2.4 million students who, who graduated from high school having done all the right things, took the right classes, got the right, the right grades, Every college qualified, that's that term, college, quali college qualified. But for whatever reason, they didn't, not, sorry, I should take that back, not for whatever reason, because of cost, they didn't complete college. There were a lot more people who, didn't, who were those types of students and didn't complete college, but these are the ones that the study attributes to cost, that they didn't finish because of cost. And the point I want to make here early on is that cost in higher education is different. The situation is different than it ever has been before. If we look at higher education, this is across the U.S. Um, we, in, in, public, in public higher education, we get our funding mainly from two sources. Tuition and fund, state funding, right? The green line there is state funding. The red line there is tuition. So look on the left side of the graph here. This is when I graduated around here. Go ahead, do the math. 
uh, and look at, at the, the percentage of my education that I was, the, was my burden, was my, what I needed to contribute. And now look at where we are now. Minnesota itself specifically isn't special. Well, it is special, but not in this case. It's actually crossed the line now, so students are actually paying most of the, the cost of higher education. And this is true in most states. Not all, but most. You saw the, average, the U.S. average there. So it's different than it ever has been, really. And, and this may seem a little damning to the University of Minnesota, but it's just the data I have, and you'll find this to be true everywhere if you, have, if you can find the data. This is a graph of the number of hours at minimum wage that a student would need to work to afford a year of tuition at the University of Minnesota. So look at on the left side of the graph, the 60s all the way through the 80s, we're talking two to 400 hours. And if you do the math there, that's a, that's a summer job. That's a full-time 40-hour week for nine or 10 weeks, you're covered. And you hear that from people who went to school back then about how they, they, they worked their way through school. And why can't kids today work their way through school? Well, this is why. A full-time job, 40 hours a week, is about, two, two, is about 2,000 hours. So, I mean, now we're talking, they'd have to have a full-time job pretty much all year round to afford a year of tuition. And again, this isn't special at the University of Minnesota. This is just an example, example data. It's different than it's ever been before. So, because, so, you know, if you think about it, um, so to afford higher education, I'll go back to this one for a second, there are really three options to afford it. You either have the money, you work to earn the money while you're going to school. Well, this is what you're up against if you're going to work to get the money. You, so you either have the money, you work to get the money, or you, you borrow it, right? And, so, and you, I don't care what day of the week it is, Google like student loans or student debt or whatever, it's a huge topic. You know, there are people saying this is the next housing bubble. So, uh, the average borrower, and about two-thirds of our students are borrowers. They take out loans. Loans that we know of, by the way. They, they, they may also take out loans from family members or others that we don't know about, but two-thirds of them actually take out loans we know about, and that's the average amount that they graduate, of debt that they graduate with. Uh, that was from a few years ago. This graph shows um, the green line there is, is uh, credit card debt nationally. The red line there is student debt. You can see where the bubble happened, kind of the financial bubble happened, 2008 or, or, or nine. People stopped borrowing for a while, right? It dropped. Didn't impact student debt at all. That's just been a constant climb. And if, if you look at the, look at over on the left side here, this is 2006. It's at $500 billion. And in 2015, it's at $1.3 trillion. Something's going on here. I mean, this is only nine years. And we're almost, they've almost tripled their debt, or they're getting close. So again, the point is, I'm trying to make, it's different than it's ever been before financially for students. So what can we do about it? Can anybody in here change the tuition at your institution? No? OK, dang. It's hoping to talk to you about that. But, uh, uh, room and board is room and board, right? It is what the market makes it. But the one thing that faculty can control and anyone who works with faculty can influence, especially in this, in this education realm where you're working with them on their courses and so on, are books and supplies, right? So that's, these are the categories that the campus, uh, sorry, the college board when it measures estimated cost of attendance for students, this is a, the, the uh, categories that they use. Book prices have gone up. There was just a story last week saying, uh, there were two stories last week. One was saying there's now a $400 textbook that sells used for $300. Uh, and they are also that the price of books since 1977 have gone up over 1,000% of textbooks, have gone up over 1,000%, which is three to four times the rate of inflation, which which is what that green line is there. That's, that's inflation, and the red line is, is uh, textbook costs. That's due to a number of factors. I, I would, my opinion on that, when it comes to economics, it's about a, almost opinion, isn't it? So I, I would say, in my, my opinion, it's a lot about the consolidation of the market for textbook companies. 
but that's my opinion. The College Board estimates that students would spend about $1,300 a year um, on textbooks. And t sorry, books and supplies, that's the category they use, but the vast majority of that is textbook costs. I have a really short video here, um, just to get, kind of get the student, I, I, I have three videos here, to, to get the student voice out there, to hear these issues about textbooks, the, the, the issues that come up because of costs. So here's, a, all we did was ask this simple question. We set up a camera on campus and set up, asked this question, what do you think about the cost of textbooks? I'm a little worried about the sound here, so cover your ears. I think they're really valuable, but the cost is just a little, little too much for students who are always already paying a lot for tuition. Find a way to make costs more manageable because tuition's going up, everything's going up, cost of living's going up, and then textbooks are going up. There is definitely a value to them, but maybe not for the cost that we pay for them. I mean, I guess professors are trying to uh, provide students with books that are reasonable, but I mean, there are some textbooks that are just, um, they're just way too pricey. I just feel like they're really overpriced, yeah. I get frustrated when a, uh, you have to buy a book that's expensive that you don't use. Textbooks are only used for so long before you're done with them, so it's like, you know, you use it for a couple months and then probably never touch it again. If people weren't just, um, issuing new additions and just increasing prices, rather stick to what you have. It is kind of expensive, and sometimes I feel like I have to buy the textbook because um, it is required. But it does kind of suck to like throw away so much money on something that you only use for a semester. They, they should keep the same textbook for several years because the material doesn't change that much. I have purchased them and I don't use them, which is kind of frustrating. I think it's outrageous, actually. Um, yeah, they cost way too much in general, I think. I'm guessing that some of the things that they said are not a surprise to anybody. I mean, you've heard that. You probably experienced some of those frustrations as a student. Nothing there is really new. But if you think about what they're saying, all of those kind of minutia of issues that they're dealing with, every single one of them has to do with cost. Like the faculty member, their, their, their faculty member didn't, didn't use the whole book. If there was no cost, why would they care? They're frustrated because they don't see, they, 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 understand the val they understand that textbooks can be valuable, they just don't think they're that valuable. $200, $300 valuable, right? So, um, by the way, nobody that we talked to said they're underpriced. In fact, nobody said, yeah, this is pretty reasonable. So, um, so, so what? So, I've had faculty tell me, I can't tell you how many times, faculty tell me, yeah, they probably spend that much money on beer every weekend or something like that, you know. Well, this is the why. Students are dealing with this cost and they're dealing with them in very creative ways. We want them to be creative, don't we? It's problem solvers. Here's what they do. They'll purchase an older version of the textbook. They'll delay buying the textbook or they just won't buy it at all. This is becoming more and more common, and there's data now showing that while the price of textbooks are going up, student spending on textbook is actually going down. The only explanation for that that I can think of really is that they're not buying them anymore. And if you ask students on your campus, I think you'll find that that's true. Um, so, and I kind of quickly go through each of these. So purchasing an, old, an older version of the textbook is a strategy it's a strategy that's very common. This was a student last year who told me this. He said, yeah, they asked me to buy an $80 French textbook. And I found one that was three editions, oh, it was two editions uh, older, and it cost eight bucks on uh, eBay, or not on eBay, on Amazon. And he, he was thrilled about it. Like, he saved this money, and he, but he also knew, and he admitted this, that he was taking some academic risk there, wasn't he? Because if, if there are assignments or readings or things like that that don't match up with that old book, but he was willing to take that shot, and this was his justification, which I loved. Delaying buying a book. I think delaying buying the book has become the norm. So, 
sometimes because they're trying to figure out how to afford them and they're just like, I gotta hold off on this. Sometimes because they have to wait for their financial aid check to come in, which usually doesn't come until after the uh, drop date, right? Uh, if they're in the uh, GI Bill, it's the same situation. There's paperwork and time that it takes to actually get the funding to buy the textbooks. So some of these students, even though they may even, they're, they're waiting for the funding, that, that means that they are spending two to three weeks without the textbook before they even get it, while they're in your class, right? So, but they're also, I, this fall, I will have three, I have three sons, they'll all be in college this fall. So if we can fix this today, I would really appreciate it. Thank you very much. So, and this is what they do. I, I'll ask them, so did you buy your textbooks yet? And, well, yeah, I'm going to wait until I really, I'm going to see if I really need them or not. In other words, I mean, that's, be, that's what I'm saying. It's kind of becoming the norm. They're, they're trying to see if they can get by. And that's a problem. That isn't what we want our, our students to be set up to, like, see what they can get by with. We want them to have the content. We want them to learn, right? Here's another short little video where all we asked was this simple question, which is just asking, have you ever delayed? He's wait, he waits till he's falling behind, right? There are, I've seen now three studies that have numbers in the 60 to 70 percent range of students who say that they, sometime in their academic career, just have not purchased, have, have because of cost, could not purchase the, the, the required textbook. Required textbook, right? So I guess if you don't remember anything else from today, I'm going to ask you to remember this. This is a survey from Florida of about over 20,000 students. Asking, their, asking them about their, the impact of textbook costs have had on their academic career. And if you think about your institution even, forget about classes even, and their learning in a way, but think about institutional goals of retention and graduation rates and student success. Look at that. I mean, what an impact this is having, a negative impact. There's no institution that should be okay with that. Really. I have one more video. And this one, um, I, we just took a couple months ago. I just kind of cut it together in the last few days. So it's just kind of a bunch of shots of, this, of one student. We basically worked with the student government to, um, they, they took a, uh, they surveyed all the students at the uh, undergrads at the University of Minnesota. And then pulled in a bunch who, uh, to, to interview about the impact of textbooks textbook costs, the high textbook costs on their, um, on their academics. I'm a business student at Carlson. Uh, right now I'm a freshman, so I'm pre-major, but I'm looking to study uh, entrepreneurial management and maybe a minor in management information system. I actually decided to buy only two of the required textbooks um, after kind of poking around and really asking people who've taken the courses uh, because I simply couldn't afford it. Um, that's when I said I took out two alternative loans from my brothers, uh, that was to pay for the cost of textbooks on top of um, the tuition. And um, so I, I have two of the required textbooks. I'm sharing a third textbook between <laughs> two of my roommates and a guy down the hall. <laughs> and um, yeah, it's, and the other two I just, I don't really worry about because, I mean, I don't have enough money for that right now, to be honest. But it, it becomes bothersome when you have to travel, you know, to another dorm just to read your own textbook. Um, but I'd say for, I mean, there's some times where they're like, I, I need the book right now, I can't, I can't give it to you. And so I just kind of have to um, twiddle my thumbs until late at night when they're done and then I can read the book and then 
usually I get shorted on sleep or something. I think sometimes I've had to stay up as late as 3, 4, or 5 a.m. and then go to sleep, get three hours, get up, and go to class because, I mean, that's when the textbook was available to me. You know, I could have focused on my studies and more, and studied more than I wanted to. Um, but, I mean, a lot of the times it was just you got shorted on sleep or you, you didn't have enough time to study as you want because I had to pass the textbook off to someone else that needed it. It's just kind of challenging because it's like, you know, it's, you, you kind of, you're struggling to get enough money and it's always kind of in the back of your mind to worry uh, throughout your day that do I have enough money to pay for my textbooks or pay my brothers back kind of thing. So it's, it's difficult. Next year, um, uh, unfortunately I think next year is going to be a lot like this semester where it's, um, uh, I'm going to have to, uh, well I'm going to have to find another job because I'm moving actually outside of the dorms because it's cheaper. Um, so I, I have to find a job because my job right now requires that I uh, live in one of the dorms and I can't do that because I can't afford it kind of thing. So um, I have to find a new job next semester. I have to probably continue with the paid research thing. Um, and then I might actually end up having to schedule my courses around what my roommates and people that I know are taking. Because if they have a shared textbook, then uh, I might have to take that class kind of thing. Because it's if it's something that maybe doesn't interest me, but it fil fulfills a requirement or elective, I might have to take that because that's 200 less dollars in textbooks. Um, well, uh, coming from Michigan to Minnesota, uh, you, you know, you always, no matter where you go, college is going to be expensive. But so I, I, I pull up and go to Minnesota, pack, unpack all my things, and then I've already done all the, uh, the tuition-based stuff where, you know, uh, they have the, on my you, you know, you turn in all that. So I'm like, okay, I'm done. And then textbook was rolled around and uh, I wasn't <laughs> quite ready for that. Um, I, I remember totaling up all of my, uh, my textbooks and the cost of them. And it was kind of like, that's a second tuition. <laughs> I can't, can't quite afford that. Um, I'm still kind of shocked because I, I'm completely broke from buying textbooks last year. So I have to take out a loan and kind of manage which ones I'm going to buy. And it's just kind of, it always, it always the second tuition, I call it, always kind of uh, surprises me. I mean, just this past year, I'd, I've probably spent in the ballpark of $1,000 and I haven't even bought all of the required texts that they told me to buy. It's been, uh, yeah, it's been difficult. <laughs> I can hardly stand watching that. It just makes me angry. And, and it's, it's um, you know, you, people can say, well, well, students can waste money in this and that, but that may be true. There may be students out there that do, but there are also students like this who are want more than anything to get an education and are doing everything. List, think of the things he was listing there, things he was, I don't know if you caught, he was doing research studies, getting paid research studies. He took out loans from his brothers. He was borrowing the students from, uh, borrowing textbooks from friends. He was scheduling his classes, the classes he was going to take based on where he could get textbooks from. Uh, I, it's not what we want. So I've been told I can be kind of depressing. Uh, and so far it has been, so we'll stop that. Uh, this is just to kind of lay the groundwork to say there's a problem. There's a clear problem here, but there's also an opportunity. What would solve these problems? What would be the ideal? When we're talking about textbooks, what would be the ideal? Free, free textbooks, right? Falling from the skies, they're free. And uh, sure, that sounds nice, but how could that possibly be? Well, and, and the reason that I, this, this, I remember going to a presentation years ago at a conference like Educause or something like that and seeing a speaker talking about open textbooks. And the questions that they got were, what's the business model? What's the business model? How can this be sustainable? And I walked away going, yeah, that's a good question. I'll, I'll, I'll tuck that in the back of my mind and we'll see if someone figures out a business model for it. 
And, and that's still the question that comes up a lot because here's the business model we're used to, right? A publisher invests in a book, invests some money in a book, they sell the book. Upon selling it, you know, they take that money, they, re in, in, uh, they recoup their investment, make the profit, they're able to then pay the authors about, you know, 10% or so. Um, and that's, that's the model we know and love, right? This is what we assume every, how everything works. And it does, generally. This is how publishers work. So if there are no sales, how could this possibly work? Why would an author write a book for free? Well, here are some other models that are possible and actually are happening and have happened. Um, I did once ask that. I used to say, like, why wouldn't I? Instead of saying, why would someone write a book for free? I would, I was, I would say, I said at a workshop once as I was talking about this, who would be dumb enough to write a textbook for free? There we go, and someone raised their hand, and I was like, oh, whoops, sorry. But that is exact. I was being facetious. That, that is exactly what it happens, is people write textbooks for their own classes and then kind of say, well, here you go, world, why not? What am I going to do with that? Maybe it'll benefit somebody else. Wonderful. That is a model. That I think was the, uh, I, that's a model that happens. It isn't necessarily the model that I think a future can be built on because faculty are busy and it's, it's kind of the assumption that this is the only way. It's a great way to get textbooks. But it's not the only way and it's not a way that necessarily academia trusts. Believe it, believe it or not. So how about this instead? And this is a, this is a model that could solve any world problem. You have a funder, right? We could solve world hunger if we had a funder, didn't we? The difference here is that we do have funders. We have funders that are saying to publishers, we will give you money to publish this book with one catch. It has to be free forever. So that students don't have to pay for it and that burden is gone. And so that means there's money to pay authors. Awesome. There you go. There's the model right there, as simple as can be. And when I say funders, it's, I'm, it, it sounds like you need a bank or you need a... But there are a number of funders for this. Funders is kind of a weird word. I should think of a different word for this. But universities are now getting into this, where they are starting to publish a few textbooks. They're working with their faculty and saying, we want to publish in this one or two. And they go through, maybe they go through their university press or they go for their, through their libraries or somebody who has expertise in publishing. And they're funding it themselves, right? They're paying the authors and they're using their own internal staff to do this. Wonderful. The Hewlett Foundation has funded um, uh, a lot of textbook production, real top-notch professional published uh, textbooks. They spent tens of millions of dollars on that. Other foundations have as well. The state of California, anyone here from California? Passed a couple years ago, passed legislation saying they're going to fund their creation of 50 open textbooks in higher education. British Columbia, not to be outdone, said, well, we're going to do 60. So uh, there is a letter that went to the White House yesterday, actually, from a coalition of over 90 organizations, including EDUCAUSE, uh, including, anyway, and basically saying anything that's federally funded, like any kind of educational materials, textbooks, whatever, that's, that's federally funded ought to be available publicly. It only makes sense, right? We're paying for it, it should be available. So, um, and also professional organizations. Cali is, a, is, a, is an organization of law schools nationally and is centered at uh, Stanford, I believe. And they, as a coalition, and using their member dues, are publishing law books that they are sharing amongst all of their members. Wonderful, what a great, what a great benefit of that saving all of them a lot of money. So, so this is the model that works except for one thing. There's one catch to this. There's one thing missing. If someone hands you a textbook, a faculty member a textbook and says, here you go, this thing is free, you can distribute this all you want. Make copies of it and distribute it to all your students or they can download. 
uh, the faculty that members that I know would be a little worried, and what would they be worried about? Credibility would be one thing. I'm looking for one other thing. It's a legal thing. Copyright. Yes, the credibility thing I can, we can, we'll talk about in a bit, but copyright. And copyright is the foundation of our intellectual property world here, right? I mean, it's important, it's critical, it protects our intellectual work. But when people are trying to share things, when the intent is to not protect, but to actually share, it kind of gets in the way. Because I have had faculty tell me, I'm not going to take the chance. I, my intellectual, pro I, if, if I am accused of some sort of intellectual property violation, that could be the end of my career, right? I mean, faculty work in academic property. That's what they do, intellectual property. The solution to that is the Creative Commons. And the Creative Commons license, Creative Commons is a nonprofit um, that is, uh, basically what their job is is to create licenses. They have created licenses that allow people to share. So that if you write a book and you want the world to have it, and, and uh, you don't want a phone call every time someone wants to use it, right? Because that's the normal process. Hey, can I copy your book? Put this license on it, a Creative Commons license on it, and people will know up front what they can and can't do. It doesn't mean you're giving up your copyright. It means you are the copyright holder and you are telling people, this is what I'm telling you is okay to do with my intellectual property. So, so the Creative Commons is the missing link. If you see that little CC symbol in the circle, and that doesn't mean closed captioned. I think that's in a square, isn't it? I don't know. Creative Commons, that little circle, that, is, that means uh, that's a Creative Commons license is, is attached to it. So these books, really need to have a, a license on them so that end users know what they can do. Um, textbooks that have those licenses and are produced in those ways are called open textbooks. They're openly licensed. That's what defines how something is open. It's licensed that way, like Moodle is open source. It's open source because it has a license attached to it saying here's what you can do with it. Don't worry about anyone suing you for piracy or whatever. Right? Not only can you copy it and install it, but you can do other things with it. And, and again, this is very similar to open source software. These Creative Commons licenses say that you can also do these things. So I, it is, I, this, I, this, I feel like this is, this is the right audience to be talking to, who have this kind of idea at heart that a course management system that is open has open source and allows you to tweak it to meet the specific needs of your students and your faculty it's exactly the same way with these textbooks. If, I'm not gonna go over these, but these are the Creative Commons license components. I, I'll, I'll just tell you quickly what they are. If you see these, so you know what they are, they're very simple, and Creative Commons has done a wonderful job of making them, this is all legal lawyer stuff, right? But they've done a, a wonderful job of making it really digestible for all of us. If you see the buy on there, the first one, that just means you can use this for all these things, just attribute the author, attribution. Fair enough, right? NC means non-commercial. That's why the dollar sign with the slash through it. So don't sell it, you can't make a profit from it. You can use it, do all these things with it, but don't make a, if you wanna make a profit from it, do what you normally would do, call me. We can talk about it, right? SA means share alike. It means if you make something new out of it, if you uh, make a derivative, if you edit it or mix it with something else, whatever it is you make needs to have the same license that I put on the original work. And then ND, most people would say this isn't really an open license because it actually locks down some things. It means no derivatives, it means you can't change it. You can share it for free, but you can't change it. And these components are put into these six, these uh, to licenses, and so if you see these, and you should see these, because they're all over the internet, the internet kind of works on CC licenses and we don't really even know it. Um, then, then you'll be able to see, you'll be able to know what they mean. So this one, the lower left means, if you use this, whatever it is, attribute me, the author, and don't make any derivatives of it, right? So for instance, here's the, here's the bottom, a, a shot of the bottom of uh, MIT's OpenCourseWare page. See the license on it? 
You're all familiar with MIT's OpenCourseWare, right? There is actually a license you are agreeing to if you use that content. I don't know if you knew that. But here's the license. It says, attribute MIT OpenCourseWare at the buy. Don't sell it, which isn't a problem for most of us, right? And if you make something new out of it, if you edit it or remix it, share it with this exact same license. Here's TED Talks. If you look at the end of a TED Talk video, it kind of goes by quick, unfortunately. You'll see the little symbols down there. Buy, so you need to, if you use this in, in your Moodle site, you put this video in there, you have to attribute TED, which isn't a big problem. Uh, you have to, you can't sell it, which again, isn't a big deal for us. We're not making money off of this. And the equal sign is the ND, no derivatives piece. So for whatever reason, the TED organization has said, we don't want you cutting this up or overlaying audio over it or doing, mixing it. I don't know why that is, but it's their choice. They are the copyright holders. They get to decide that. So you know what you can do with them. You don't have to call the TED organization and say, hey, I want to use this for my philosophy class. Is that okay? They don't want you to call them. They're telling you right here, go ahead, use it. To me, this is very similar. I just took this photo out here. I mean, this is the same spirit, isn't it? really, of open source software, but it's about course content and about textbooks. And when we do this, we can solve this bigger problem of affordability. And when we realized this, I realized this about three years ago, realized that one of the problems with open textbooks is that faculty didn't know where to find them because they were kind of sprouting up all over the place. Lots of people were making them. And so we put together a catalog of them, a library of open textbooks, and it's at open.umn.edu, and um, it's been very well received, and it's been going for about, it has, say, three and a half years, I guess, now. We went from about 75 books in the beginning to over, I think we have over 185 books, 185 books in there now, and it's growing quickly because, I've, as I mentioned earlier, there's states and provinces and governments and universities, and I mean, making these things now, and it's really going very well. Um, and it's available, I mean, it's just an open platform. I mean, you can, uh, sorry, I shouldn't use that term in this audience. It's not, it's, it's an, it, you don't have to sign up for anything. You just go in there, search for a book, download the book, get it, right? Here's some examples. These are created at Rice University. They have had a large investment by a bunch of foundations to create some really top-notch books. Some of these cost upwards of a million dollars to create, believe it or not. They're not cheap to make. Lots of ancillary materials, lots of uh, you know, PowerPoints that go with them and quiz banks and whatever else. And what their goal is, this is, this is OpenStax. Uh, yeah, you can see it on the upper left there, OpenStax College. And their goal is to make the books for the top 25 enrolled courses in the US. And they're more than halfway there. I think they're at about 15 or 16 books now. Here's an example of one. And this is probably their most popular book. It has, um, it has double digit market share apparently in, in the uh, um, algebra based college physics courses across the country and community colleges and four-year colleges and universities. And here are some of the benefits of it being open. Forget the fact that you can edit it because you can do that. Forget the fact that you can remix it and do that. Let's just, if you just take the book just on its own. This is a two semester book, right? I mean, you can cover two semesters of physics with this. Almost 1,300 pages. It's available as a PDF, as an EPUB, you can order it in print, and generally what it, it'll cost something when you print it, of course, because printing costs money, but it'll be about 20% of the cost of a commercial textbook. So this is about $40 to $50, and it would be maybe $250 as a two-semester physics book. That would be probably a cheap physics book. You can read it on the web if you want to. I don't know why you would, but you would. I don't know if anyone's familiar with Bookshare, but um, basically they've taken these books then and put them into a system for accessible um, because they're open, because we're not worried about people stealing the content, right, which happens with commercially published, they want it pretty, keep it pretty locked down so you can't share it with somebody else. Because it's open, it can be shared into systems that make it more accessible, much easier. 
And I know the accessibility people, I've talked to a few folks here on campus, are very excited about open content because they have this real desire to make sure that everything, on, everything that, all the content that comes into our campus is accessible to everyone. If it's not, they have a lot of work to do to make it accessible. So open content is there already. There are manuals, PowerPoint slides, all of that. And again, this has already gained double-digit market share across the US. One other example. Uh, oh, this is, this is the uh, CALI, which is Computer Assisted Legal Instruction, the center, uh, again, at, at Stanford. And um, they have uh, published, I am trying to remember how many they have now. I think it's 20, 26 and, and growing legal books. And they change them every year. So you'll notice on the titles on the bottom, they have years on them because, of course, laws change. So they have to edit them every year. So they're doing a wonderful job of maintaining this collection of textbooks for all of their members. And they are, I don't remember how many schools there were. Did I say that earlier? Forget how many. It's a lot of law schools, like 70 or 80 law schools across the country. So, uh, so when, I, when I first was asked for a title for this presentation, I thought, you know, the, the usual reaction I get to this kind of thing is, oh, that sounds nice. Sounds really nice. But let's go back and we've got to deal with, you know, our textbooks. And, and that's absolutely true. You do. I mean, we do, we're in that space. And so when I titled my presentation, it was based on this. I love this quote. This is from Kennedy's inaugural speech. And he listed a lot of really aspirational goals. Exploration of, of deep seas and space, uh, peace, uh, you know, nuclear arms proliferation kind of goals. And at the end of all of these huge things, he says this, you know, and this will not be finished in the first hundred days, nor will be finished in the first thousand, or in the life of this administration, nor ever, nor even perhaps in the lifetime of this planet. But let us begin, because it's kind of the, it's the right thing to do. And, and I feel like that about this. But since I was asked for that title, I intended to end on this. But I'm going to end on something else, and that's actually evidence that we're well beyond that, actually. Um, so if you take inspiration like, from this like I do, awesome. You know, let us begin for this. But let me show you some, some data. This is traffic on the, the, the Open Textbook Library site. Since its launch in the beginning of, of, of 2012. And remember what the audience is for this. this. The audience is faculty. So it's not a huge audience to begin with. But the first year of traffic we'll now cover in about six weeks. And I'm guessing this fall that'll be, that'll be cut in half even. Every semester the traffic just jumps and jumps again. We've asked faculty to, as I'm running workshops, I run workshops across the country at different institutions. I'll talk about that in a little bit. But we asked faculty to go in and rate the textbooks because quality was something that was brought up, right? Like, what's, the, what are, what's going to be the issue? Quality. Of course it is, and it should be the question faculty ask. Well, they listen, when it comes to quality, faculty listen to each other, right? Peer review. So we asked faculty to review the books on a scale of 1 to 5, and we have about 200, a little over 200 reviews right now. And this is where they fall, which is really, I mean, I just put them in the library. I have no idea how good they are. I'm not qualified to judge them all. In fact, probably none of them. So that's a great sign that the books that are out there are, have some quality, and it's not according to me. At the University of Minnesota, um, started in the College of Education and Human Development, this, this initiative, in a little over three years, we have fewer than, we had this little pilot group of faculty, and, and, and it's slowly kind of grown a few at a time, but um, fewer than 20 faculty over three years have saved our students potentially over five, just under $500,000, half a million dollars. That, that little tiny group. So, thank you. So, so imagine, I mean, this is 20, less, fewer than 20 people. And they don't teach the same course every semester. I mean, this is a normal cycle. Maybe they teach it once a year. And, and these, I don't think any of these were large enrollment courses either. Imagine if it was a large enrollment course. So this is happening. And in fact, 
as we speak, right here today, you, this is your inaugural meeting of uh, the US uh, Moodle moot, right? So across campus, there is the inaugural meeting, which started yesterday, of the Open Textbook Network. And this is a network of schools, of institutions, who are committed to advancing open textbooks on their campuses. Yeah. Here we go. It's a variety. It's from, it, it covers community colleges all the way through uh, research institutions like ourselves. And this list is growing so fast. Like I said, you know, when I was asked for the, when I was asked for the title of this, um, the size of this group was maybe half of what it is now. And we're talking, you know, three months ago, whatever it was. We have Minnesota State Colleges and Universities. That's 34, that's a system, 34 institutions. We have the North Dakota University system. That's 11. We have the community colleges in Oregon. That's 17. So overall, I think we're over 75 institutions nationally. And my pr program director is telling me that next week we'll have another half dozen. And it's just kind of... Um, Really, really exciting. This is happening. Here they are. The blue dots are the system schools, where the systems have bought in. So if Kennedy's saying didn't inspire you that maybe this can happen, or maybe we can make, some, make, make this work, hopefully that it is working. It's moving forward. and. Um, and that's, uh, I, I, I've been in this, my background is educational technology. My PhD is in, in, in learning technologies from the University of Minnesota here. And, and I've been the CIO, or I've been at the university working in this area for 15 years. Before that, for 12 years in K-12. And I'm going to tell you that I have not seen in, I've got to be careful here, I guess, because I don't want to sound disparaging to any other technology like Moodle, but I'm going to tell you that, because it's not the case at all, I don't see potential in any other technology. I mean, in, in, let me put it this way again. Let me think here. How do I say this? <laughs> I see more potential in open textbooks and in open OER than I do in any technology that I've seen in those 27 years, as far as improving teaching and learning. And if we can latch on to that open content management systems, open data, open research, open all of those kinds of things, isn't that what higher education is supposed to be about? This free exchange of ideas, right? Standing on the shoulders of giants, all of that. Isn't that the, what we're all aiming for? I'll, I want to invite you to take, to use the Open Textbook Library. Point your faculty to that. Those of you who work with faculty every day on your courses, part of, if you think of yourselves as, uh, your job is to help faculty or become uh, better teachers. That hopefully now, after this morning, you be, you've got an idea that, that this could be a piece of that. Directing them, pointing them at these resources. They may not work, and they, they may work, they may not work. That's up to them. Academic freedom, they need to decide that themselves. I'll also ask you to take a look at the Open Textbook Network. And if your institution is interested in getting involved, there's information on that site that'll, that'll get you there, and we'll start a conversation. And, um, show up at your campus and run workshops and so on. Invite you to next year's uh, institute that we have on campus here this year. So thank you for your time. Um, do we have time for questions? Thank you. Got a couple over there. Thanks, Mark. Thank you, David. That was excellent. Um, are there any restrictions internationally? Are the books available to us on the other side of the world? Yes, they are, and there are openly licensed books everywhere. Now, the Creative Commons licenses, Creative Commons has offices in, boy, I don't know this, I think it's 80-some countries. Uh, they have, um, um, their licenses are ported internationally so that they can, I, I don't understand the technical nature of this because that's a lawyer's role. But yes, absolutely, they are available. I'm about to, um, I've, I've been invited to a lot of mainly English speaking countries, South Africa, um, Barbados, I really wanna go there, no. Uh, uh, in the winter, 
No. Uh, and, and yes, the answer is absolutely yes. The books are available uh, there as well. The licenses should be covered internationally as well. Yep. So I wanted to give a shout out for, in my area, a lot of the upper level open source books are um, labors of love from people in a certain area who they may have gone after a book deal and there was only 20 people who wanted that book so they just put it online. So right. it, that's nice. That's upper level and not a lot of them were sold anyway. I wanted to ask you, do you think that publishers, is there's any possibility that they will take more of a software uh, business model and say, you know what, instead of selling to students, we will, we're going to show you all the things we offer in a particular school and you pay us a fixed price per year and you will have access to any of these books. Uh, they are definitely already there. Their model is, right now is moving out of content actually and into services, which may be competition for Moodle. Um, I, I don't know if that's what you were asking, but they, they kind of, under, I think they understand that content is not the future for them because content can be free. And so they are right now trying to, to work with institutions to license that kind of access. That is the model they want, actually, to say $20 per head. You as an institution pay us. We'll give you access to this content. Um, it's great for them because it cuts out the used textbook market. It cuts out all aspect of choice that students have anymore. You know, they, they make all those decisions about what to buy where and buy used, borrow from a friend, whatever. That's gone. They are now charged a fee, likely, course fee. That goes to the publishers. Um, but then the publishers are also building course management systems, basically, where there's all this value add in there, right? There's, all, there's a test bank attached that's aligned with the course. Here's a, that is definitely where they're going, and that's where they want to be. It's better, it's more profitable, I think, for them. But. Hi, Dave. Hey, Fritz. Um, so this is going to sound somewhat cynical, but it picks up on your question. What will prevent, um, if the funding is coming from outside entities besides uh, publishers, what would prevent governments and university systems from then passing that cost that they're incurring to develop open textbooks back into and down to students through tuition increases? Because one of the reasons tuitions have gone up and and state appropriations have gone down over the last 20 plus years because they could. It's a lever state legislatures could pull. Right. Uh, they knew they could. They knew students would pay the cost. So mm -hmm. that's my question. Mm -hmm. Yeah, good question. And right now, a lot of the development is, is foundation funded. So it's kind of free to us, right, in a way. It's free to higher education. Um, I'm guessing that if your question is how do we keep that from happening, I'm guessing we don't. I think that what needs to happen is higher education needs to own its own content. We need to own this. We do that in a lot of other areas. We do it in accessibility. We, we are saying we think it's important as higher ed institutions that all students have access to education, and we own that. We don't look at it as an expense. We look at it as a mission-driven thing. We do that with educational technology, right? We have educational technology people because we believe it is, it's mission-driven, mission-important. It costs something. So I guess my answer to that, Fritz, is that it, it, we don't. We don't keep it from, from becoming an expense. Think of it, though, as a trade-off from what it is. Look at what that could be versus what is, which is an eight point whatever billion dollars textbook industry. Imagine what we could do in higher education with content with eight point whatever billion dollars. The cost would be much, much less for us and then therefore for students. So good question, though. Yes, sir. Hi, David. Great. Great talk. It's Sean Gilligan, founder of uh, Web Anywhere, one of the Moodle partners. Now, it's really timely and ironic because literally this morning, I've just self-published on SoundCloud uh, my short business book. Um, <laughs> and then you're talking about eBooks. Uh, you can access it at um, uh, soundcloud.com forward slash Web Anywhere. But when you said no one's dumb enough to give it away for free, I thought, gosh, I, I put my hand up and I perhaps shouldn't. Have done, but <laughs> but um, how, would, how, would, how would SoundCloud... And, and my flexible book uh, fit in with the open textbook library. If you could just explain that, because I've got to say I'm, I'm quite ignorant around Creative Commons. I've heard about it. Right. Uh, I do agree with you about open content, but if you could maybe just advise me how I could link in my free book with your ecosystem, that'd be interesting. Okay, first Thank of you. all, I want to make clarify my comment about the dumb whatever. 
I was joking. Uh, so I, 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 I love the fact that people is sure. I, I have a shirt on underneath this that says, it has a little Creative Commons logo on it. It says, I love to share. I love that, that you're sharing. Uh, how do you tap into this? So, so, so to get into like the library and itself and all of that, we have a few criteria. And these criteria are simple. They're, we're, we're thinking of changing them, but it has to be a full book because learning objects have been done. You go to Merlot Connections, you can do that. This is focused because textbooks are easy for faculty to grasp. So that's one thing. Openly licensed, it needs to be openly licensed. It needs to be in some downloadable format. If you're gonna exercise editing, um, mixing, you need to have it. You can't rely on that website to be up. Um, anyway, there's a lot of other reasons that that is a, is a requirement to be in there. And then fourth, um, oh, this is a requirement that we're changing. In fact, the group across campus is talking about this as we speak. Um, the requirement right now is that somebody outside your institution is using it. And this is the only measure of quality that we were using. It's kind of like, I, I can't judge the book because I don't teach these areas, but if, it must, if it's good enough for somebody else, then it, we'll put it in there. But we're changing that because that's a chicken and egg thing. How can someone else use it if they don't know it exists? And so um, I would encourage you to, I guess, make sure the book is in a number of formats. There's an accessibility uh, benefit to that as well, right? The best accessible content is when you have content in a range of formats. So, um, so that would be it. Does that answer it for you? I think we're out of time. We are. Great. Yeah. Thank you very much.